The Renault Espace was a pioneering MPV, but it very nearly wasn't a Renault at all. Let's take a look at the fascinating history of the Espace. So let's get into the Renault Espace story. It begins with Matra, a huge French industrial conglomerate uh, that built um, weapons and um, missiles, all sorts of things, but also decided to get into the car building business by building René Bonnet, a small sports car manufacturer who um, inevitably found that there's very little profit in sports cars. Undeterred, uh, Matra continued with uh, the development of cars such as the M530, which used the Ford V4 engine. Very pretty, very unusual little car. Uh, followed it up with the three-seater Matra Bagheera, which used Simca running gear, and followed that with the Morena, which also used Simca running gear. And it was that relationship with Simca, when Simca became part of Chrysler, that led to Matra itself becoming part of uh, Chrysler, the, well, the automobile arm anyway. So with Simca going into Chrysler and Matra being pulled into it as well, they, they began to think about what their future projects might be. And it was actually a British designer working for Chrysler, uh, Fergus Pollock, who conceived this one box people carrier concept. And Matra ran away with it and said, okay, yeah, we, we can develop this into a, a working production vehicle. Sadly, Chrysler Europe rather failed and was sold to Peugeot for one pound. So Peugeot weren't keen to have Matra, they didn't really see the point of it, and uh, it was actually bought out by the management at the time. Matra had ceased all its motorsports, so they had a historic involvement with Formula One, Le Mans, all sorts going on. Everything was consolidated into car production uh, with the those aforementioned sports cars and the Matra Rancho. But once it had been bought out by the management, they approached Renault to see if Renault would be interested in taking on this one box concept. And Renault said yes. So the design was hastily adapted. It was designed around transverse running gear. They had to make a longitudinal engine fit. And as we can see, that wasn't without issue. Just before I open the bonnet, let's just talk structure. Matra was pioneering in the use of glass fiber. It worked really well for sports cars and they reasoned it could work really well on a family car as well. Uh, so what we have are glass fiber panels attached to like a steel galvanized space frame underneath, uh, which obviously gives it great strength and should give it great longevity as well. But the bonnet is very light because it is plastic. And if we look under here, we can see the four cylinder engine and you can see how compromised this layout is been a longitudinal engine. That's how Renault did it. The Renault 21 in two liter and diesel forms had a longitudinal engine. It was transverse, weirdly, for the 1.7. But uh, it had to work with the bigger engines. These cars had a lot of weight to carry around. So uh, longitudinal, it was. The radiator is somehow crammed in just in front of the engine. The radiator fan must sit to one side because there's no room for it otherwise. The engine looks very vulnerable there being right at the front, but uh, there we go, that's the design compromise. It's the one box styling that really marks the uh, Spass out as something different. And it's easy to lose sight of how radical this design looked when the car came out in 1984. Incidentally, the same year that Chrysler launched its Voyager minivan on a similar sort of a format. It's a Fascinating design, this sloping front with the uh, windscreen so far away from the driver, but it helps give an enormous amount of space inside because the flat floor uh, is so low and the seats so high, people sit in a shorter format than if they their legs outstretched and it just gives you that much more space. In the rear, the seats are individual. They, they can be moved around, they can be folded forward, they can be uh, tipped uh, as you need. If we uh, pop a head restraint out, I can pull that lever and fold the seat down, pull another lever down here, and the seat tips up out of the way. That gives access to the rearmost seats. And it uh, must be said, space is a bit tight back here for my um, naked knees, but you know, with, with the seat moved to its foremost position, I can actually. Um, fit here in reasonable comfort. Obviously it's designed more for children. And there isn't a whole lot of boot space once you've got the uh, seats in place either, but obviously leave one of the seats at home and suddenly you've got masses of space. 
very, very plentiful indeed. By the way, look at the engineering in these seats. Watch how the rear legs, as you fold it down, the rear legs fold out, ready to latch into the floor. And if you took the rear seats out, I think you could actually move the seats to a rearward position so you have even more leg room. But even in standard form, as here, I got so much space in this middle row. Um, that seat's um, set up for, for my sort of liking and there's loads of space. And with the um, deep side windows, there is um, good visibility as well. Plenty of headroom. One little detail, the wiper position changes for right or left hand drive, just as it did on the Matra Rancho. That required an entirely different tailgate pressing. Very impressive. But if we open the tailgate and stop focusing on such trivial matters, it's not hard to imagine how useful this space would be once you get all the seats out. Or even if you just fold that row of seats forward. There's so much space, it's such a practical, versatile vehicle. Many, many different uses. In terms of the driving position, it's really good. There's excellent visibility because the windows are enormous. Big, soft, squashy seats are really comfortable and supportive. Driving position is quite nice. There are a few downsides. The pedal area is actually uh, affected by wheel arch intrusion, so it's actually quite tight. I think it's even worse on right-hand drive. But, you know, all the pedals are there. It's just, compared to my enormous feet, it's a bit of a squeeze down there. The other issue is if you put your sat-nav on the windscreen, you're not going to be able to reach it because the windscreen is like here. Um, although perhaps you could attach it to this capacious side window, which um, ensures a good view all round. There are other things I like as well. Uh, it sadly doesn't work, but look at this. This must have been a serious bit of kit back in the day. A Philips stereo amplifier with graphic equalizer. So you can change all the um, sound settings. We've got a little ashtray here, 12 volt power outlet. Very, very quiet indicator and a central locking button. There we go, lock and unlock, nice digital clock. And a glove box over here, and also one up here. This is where your lockable glove box is. But it's a bit, <laughs> bit of a challenge to reach it. But we've got some lovely space down here, and now we've even got a model, which has been painted the same color. And I must talk about the color, because you may think this car looks a little hand-painted, and uh, that's, I've locked myself in apparently uh, that's because it is hand painted it's been hand painted this lovely shade of green um, with a brush inspired by my own reliant fox so there you go I, um, I apologize to everyone for the fact that has happened I think we should probably actually go for a drive but uh, we'll just start the engine first of all it's a two litre carburetor about 109 brake horse I believe there we go typical Renault stalks they're a bit cracky you sort of turn that switch for your headlamps that's the main beam and uh we've got the wiper stalk on this side which um i think was a pull is it there we go i've got the wipers in operate the wipers are miles away aren't they hello wipers over there but good overlap no triangle of doom although the um washer jet position is giving us a slight dribble of um despair there we go i think we're all right like i said the gear lever is quite long but um it seems reasonably accurate so we'll, we'll go and take this puppy for a ride into first all of the lock power steering naturally fitted i've still got a dribble going on haven't i oh dear it's a it is an automatic choke and it seems a little um oversensitive at times uh, i need to put the windows up interestingly the windows the left switch operates the um, uh, right window and the right switch operates the left. I don't know if they were like that from the factory. This one was apparently in very poor order when the owner bought it, hence having to um, repaint it. Sounds very, very Renault, doesn't it? Reminds me of my own Renault 21. And unsurprisingly, it drives really nicely, it rides really well over these speed humps, just sort of floats. The French, just marvellous. Uh, suspension. It's not a uniquely Citroen thing by any stretch of the imagination. And uh, yeah, it's just a really pleasant car to drive. You, you soon get used to the fact um, you cannot see the bonnet. Utterly lost down there. Uh, but uh, otherwise, you kind of just feel like you're driving a normal car, just one that is more like a box on wheels. When you get to bends, it doesn't all get unpleasant. 
turns in nicely. Maybe that's that Matra heritage. Yeah, it's a nice lusty engine. I had the same engine in my Renault 21 Monaco. Plenty of torque, so you don't have to wring its neck. Nice relaxing transport, and I used to comfortably get 35 miles to the gallon out of my uh, Renault 21. It's just really pleasant. The, 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 the sound insulation seems pretty good as well. So I imagine this revolutionized family transport. The French, uh, being a Catholic nation, uh, knew a thing or two about large families, so they already had a range of Peugeots and Citroën estates uh, that offered multi-seating, but I'm not sure Renault did until the Espace. So they were lacking that people carrier to rival Peugeot, notably the 504 and 505, and Citroen with the absolutely enormous DS and CX estates. So it was quite a long gestation period for the Espace. I think the design sketches were initially done in 1978. That was project P18. And happily that still exists. I'm not sure whose collection it's in. I guess it should be in Peugeot's collection. Uh, that original concept from the uh, late 70s. And it wasn't until 1984 that production actually began on these. Sales were initially a little slow. People were a bit wary of this space shuttle on wheels. But uh, it soon began to find an awful lot of favor. So the Renault Espace went through further generations and Matra built the Mark 1, 2 and 3. Unfortunately Renault took the uh, production of the F Mark 4 in-house, but uh, I'm going to cover that in a later video. We are going to jump later into the Matra story with a future road test and uh, some of you may be able to work out what that is. It's just really nice, the gear change is really nice, it's nice and accurate. Uh, this one's got 323,000 kilometers on the clock yet you would not think that at all to drive it that's astonishing I might overtake this Opel Aguila it's a little slow yeah this is not a stupendously brisk machine to be honest well we're gonna do some highway driving and see how it is at higher speed uh, it shouldn't be too bad, really, because uh, France is a country full of auto routes. Yeah, given how tall it is, it really doesn't roll around too much. Obviously, that is some, coming from someone who is quite used to French cars rolling around a lot. Now we can only go up to 100 kilometers an hour for that is the speed limit uh, in here in the Netherlands during the daytime. But uh, we're approaching the dizzy heights of 100 kilometers an hour right now, which is 62 miles an hour. And uh, it's hard to imagine a more relaxing drive, to be honest. The visibility is truly excellent for a motorway. You've got plenty of over shoulder vision both ways. But yeah, very, very easy to lose sight of how radical this vehicle was upon launch. In a sea of um, Ford Sierras and Vauxhall Cavaliers, suddenly this thing went, no, I'm a proper family wagon. And it was the start of Renault leading the way because Renault would develop the Megane Scenic. As the Espace grew larger, there was room underneath for a smaller MPV. And, uh, you know, that begat the Vauxhall Zafira, the Citroen Zara Picasso, all jumping on the MPV bandwagon. You can still buy a Renault Espace today in France, but not in the UK. Renault pulled out of the UK market with the Espace. And I think that's because tastes have changed. MPVs aren't quite as popular as they once were. Everyone's gone a bit SUV mad instead, which is a bit of a shame, because an SUV cannot even get close to matching the practicality of a Renault Espace. It's just a big empty box. There is so much space. Yeah, I'm staggered and perhaps a little upset that it's taken me this long to actually drive a Renault Espace. I always thought I would like an Espace. Yeah, I've never owned one, never driven one until today. What, what an idiot. Why has it taken me so long? Now there are none left. Because uh, they really have absolutely vanished. See, this is something else I like. We're doing a thousand revs at 30 kilometers an hour in third gear. 
and he's just ambling along entirely happily. It, it is having no problem with this at all. It's so unfussy in a way, you know, modern engines aren't always. So there you go, that was the really rather marvellous Renault Espace, uh, the start of a very fruitful relationship between Matra and Renault. In a future video, we will look at how that turned a little sour because the owner owns an example of the end of this relationship. So stay tuned for that. Otherwise, thank you very much for watching. Don't forget you can head to the Hubnut store and I will see you in a future video. Farewell. Interesting. Does that mean I've got to get across this crossing quickly? What was that noise? <laughs>